And there is no excitement since they got the gold and Nika already yesterday and we, we know who the winner is. We decided at the end of the day uh, for the P2P Foundation. I want, before um, I ask him, um, the representative on stage, uh, give you some of the reasons why at the end of the day we said that they should be, um, be, get the gold and Nika. Um, we're talking about a community who isn't just a community by itself, but is an enabler to other communities. So they built tools open to everybody to, I don't know, use it, hack it, put it on the next stage, um, help them make something even more awesome out of it, and therefore endorse um, C. Williams as well as a, a, like progressive governments. Um, to build new forms of self-owned and self-regulated -reg democratic structures and like inspire cities, towns, or, yeah, well, countries. So, um, <laughs> to nail it down, I quote P2P um, uh, itself, like it operates on the belief that to respond to the global crisis, it will be necessary to bring together three paradigms of thought and action sustainability, open source cultures, and solidarity economy. So let's take a deeper look into the project it itself. Um, a very warm welcome to Staco Troncoso from uh, Spain, from B2B Foundation. Hi. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So let me get... Um, mm. Slides up. Oh, it was really nice fun. Okay. Okay, so digital communities and radical atoms. What's, what's the idea over here? And what has it got to do with P2P? Well, P2P by nature is based on communities. And not only does it harness the power of communities, but it actively creates new communities at higher levels of complexity, thanks to digital tools, etc. I will be explaining what our definition of P2P is, but from this talk, I would like you to take home three ideas. The first one is that P2P is increasingly moving from the periphery of the way that we create and distribute value towards the center. The second is that there are different types of P2P, and not all of them are beneficial. Some of them may actually be harmful. And the third one is that the, the good type of P2P, the one that we advocate for in our community, is always based in the idea of the commons. Um, since 2008, we've seen an exponential growth in the number of P2P initiatives worldwide. And of course, a lot of these initiatives, they come up in reaction to something, to a systemic breakdown of the existing systems that we have. And just to frame it, what, what is the existing system? We can give it many names. Okay, can you see the, um, you should be able to see the nice pictures. Oh, thank you so much. So, what I was saying was that um, P2P systems have grown exponentially in the last few years as a reaction to, to the current system, which maybe we can characterize as a system based in unquestioned growth. Now, growth is really good during adolescence. Systems have to grow before they mature, and they spend a tremendous amount of energy and resources doing so before they either die away or they stabilize. So if we look at society, I mean, the growth paradigm, you can go back 200 years to the Industrial Revolution, 500 to the birth of capitalism, you can go back 10,000 years to the Agricultural Revolution, and the necessity of hierarchical systems to deal with surplus. But this narrative of growth also gives us these types of growths. And if you look at this chart, this is devastating. The aggregate of this information paints a really despairing picture except for the rise of te telecommunications, which may bring about the answer. This is conceptually hard to understand, but these are the realities. Today is the 10th of September, and it's incredibly hot outside. So we see how these systems are beginning to affect us in really negative ways. And to exacerbate the problem, we have our priorities upside down. So what is scarce by nature, what we should be taking care of, which are natural resources, 
Well, we're consuming them 60% faster than we can regenerate it. We're treating nature as if it was infinitely abundant. We have resource scarcity, we have environmental degradation, but the system goes on. Ironically, at the same time, what is naturally abundant and can be reproduced and distributed digitally at minimal cost, which is knowledge, is being made scarce. It's being kept behind patents, IP, copyright. And the irony is that to, to heal the problem that we have with the resources and with the environment, we need all the knowledge. We need to open source those patents, whether it's in medicine, environmentalism, agriculture, etc. So this is the depressing picture in my presentation. And things will get happier from now on. Here's where the systems seem to be leaving us. And what are we looking at when we're looking at the epilogue to the end of history? Is this the end? Is this the logical outcome of this narrative? Do you think that the systems which are created these problems can be turned around to solve them? And I think that within governments and corporations, there are people with incredibly good intentions. But the limiting factors of the systems that they're working in will not allow them to solve the problems. This is one narrative, this epilogue to the end of history. But there's another story. And this is the kind of story that we have to make visible and we have to tell ourselves so we can have a different outcome. So with that, we come to P2P. And let's not rush to say, yes, P2P is the new narrative. It will solve all the problems. Because there are different types of peer-to-peer. -peer, and some types of P2P interactions may exacerbate the problems that are created by the growth-oriented operating system. So I'll give you some examples. So take Facebook, take Twitter, take Instagram, take any social media system. Um, Facebook is incredibly useful. There's people who find lost dogs through Facebook. There are people who organize revolutions through Facebook, and then they name their children Facebook in honor of what's happened. So there's tremendous use value being created in the front end. But what happens in the back end? What happens to the monetization? It's all taken by the platform. None of it is being given back to the value creators. And if all the users left Facebook all of a sudden, what would become of Facebook? It wouldn't exist. Facebook makes it easy for you to share, but really hard to keep your privacy. You are the commodity of Facebook. Um, if Twitter or Facebook was a nation, would it be a democracy? Not really. You don't have a say on how the platform is governed. You don't have a say on whether Facebook decides to run a social experiment to manipulate your emotions. So Facebook is P2P in the front, huge use value being created, but it's centralized on the back. Oh, and we have, okay. Now, yes, <laughs> we have um, the so-called sharing economy, which in a context of resource scarcity sounds like a great idea. We mutualize resources with, you know, under the ethics of community. But are we really mutualizing the resources or are we just capitalizing them? And also this imagery of community has been taken away by these platforms when what they really are doing is being middlemen. And how is it peer-to-peer? -peer? If Think of Uber, think of, think of Airbnb. They're not really talking about transportation or housing. They're making you work for the platform. So if I have a house on Airbnb, I'm providing the labor and I'm providing the property but I get none of the social benefits that had been fought for in the last century. It brings about increased precarity under P2P interactions in the front end. We could reimagine other systems. We could reimagine Airbnb as a co-op, and in fact there are people doing it, same with Uber. Bitcoin, another P2P system. Some people will tell you Bitcoin will save the world. Well, maybe um, the underlying technology is P2P, but how is it peer-to-peer -peer if I'm a poor farmer and I have one computer and there's a conglomerate in China with supercomputers? Um, we're not interacting in the same conditions. And Bitcoin has also the dubious honor of having a 0 0.88 gradient in the Gini index of inequality. So it's more unequal than actual fiat currencies. So these types of P2P, which are for-profit oriented P2P, which are growth oriented P2P, they curtail the revolutionary potential of P2P. They don't go all the way. It's taking the term, you know, like the same way that democracy is bandied about. And we say, oh, we must have freedom of democracy, but you can have democracy between two options every four years. And we're not talking about radical democracy all the way through. We have to talk about P2P all the way through, on the front and in the back. 
we have to let the exchange value that is created by this massively productive system to go back to the value creators. And, of course, there's alternatives and there's other ways of looking at it. The way that we look at peer-to-peer, -peer, we like to define it not in such a technological way as most people understand it, but we say that it's person-to-person, people-to-people, peer-to-peer. It's systems for creating value in a non-coercive, non-hierarchical way, which are then deposited in commons pool, common pools. And this is the important thing, the commons. What do you do with that value? Well, the commons is the other component of what we call the, um, the coherent P2P. And the etymology of commons is quite interesting. It comes from the Latin munis, which means both gift and responsibility. Now, gift and responsibility, if you think about resources, if you think about relationships, if you think about nature, is a totally way, different way of managing resources than the extractivist manner that we see in other systems. Um, there's no commons without commoning. Although there are urban commons, digital commons, natural commons, it's the human interaction of the communities created around them that bring them to life. So a commons always has three components. A resource, one, the community that's gathered around the resource and the protocols to govern this resource. So if we look at refugee Facebook, um, Facebook yes. <laughs> um, the resource itself is language, it's the multiple language. The community is the translators, it's the people who are running the web page, it's the refugees, they all have a say on how the platform is run. And at the same time, the governance model is how do you input the data, how does it come out, how does it go to the printer. This is a successful commons, and we can see the systems increasing. There are two billion people worldwide that sustain themselves out of natural commons, but the commons is invisible to market and to governments, and this is the problem. We have to make the commons more visible. So the commons and P2P together, this is, this is the meaning of what to us are digitally amplified existing communities. And this is the kind of peer-to-peer -peer economy and politics that we have to strive for. And with this, to give you examples of, of this kind of commons-oriented peer-to-peer, we talk about the open source circular culture and its economy and its politics. And one example of this is the, um, the movement um, that is centered in local resiliency. Think of eco-villages, think of transition towns, think of people getting together to create value in their localities in this context of resource scarcity. Um, there are systems like in Madison, Wisconsin with a mutual aid network or in Catalonia with the Catalan Integral Co-op that bring together time banks, community currencies, um, credit unions, co-ops into these meta-economic systems that break down the distinctions between producers and consumers. So these localized systems are great, and a lot of them are network over the internet, but they are not enough. We have to think globally, because I may have my wonderful community agriculture garden, but the neighbor is planting Monsanto terminator seeds, and the wind blows over, and that's the end of my garden. And this is just a really silly example to tell you that whenever there's a commons, there will be an enclosure. And there are currently enclosures going on, massive land grabs in Africa, the, DNA, the human DNA is being patented and copyrighted, so we have to build political power. We have to build economic power as commoners with systems. And these systems can be characterized, as Sarah said in the introduction, by three, three approaches. They have to be free, fair, and sustainable. By free, I don't mean as in free beer, even though that's nice, but it's in open. So free means open data, open access, the right to modify and remix, the right to hack, to take existing systems and repurpose for something that they were not designed for, and not only create an information commons that can be taken up, adapted, modified, and improved like an ecology by anyone, but also to really mutualize physical interest, infrastructures where possible. Fair, well, fair means labor solidarity. It means livelihood for commoners. For, includes the co-op movement, the social and solidarity economy, but it goes beyond welfare because welfare only deals with issues of labor. What happens to invisible labor? What happens to reproductive labor? What happens with the work that takes place in the home? What happens with voluntary contributions? We have to take care of all these people who are creating incredible value and not relegate them to constant precarity. And the final component of this system is sustainable. 
and sustainability is, is inherent to the commons because if you, if you take your relationship with nature and with humans as a gift and as responsibility, you obviously want to keep them healthy for future generations and for your own enjoyment. Sustainability within the P2P commons movement is an inherent motivator. It's not an externality to be dealt with later. So an example of this, and there are many concrete examples, um, we have an open design commons. So say that you need a tractor for your farm. You have the designs online, and these designs are tweaked, and they're better for lo and they're produced for local circumstances. But who's making the stuff? Well, we say design global, manufacture local. What is light, what is abundant, information has to be shared openly globally. But actual manufacture should be kept close to the places where this, the outputs of the manufacture will be used. So with this information commons, through fab labs, through 3D printing, addictive manufacturing, we can have co-ops that create, that create these resources to be used. And in the ecological sense, when you're creating something custom made, which all the creativity that implies, you're talking about economies of scope, not of scale. You're not producing for the market, even though livelihoods can be made. You know, um, whatever your labor is when producing this, you should be paid for. You're producing for your locality. And things like plan obsolescence go out the window because the use value is being kept close to home. And the ecological devastation of the transportation chains that we have today gets nullified with systems such as this. Um, you have examples for housing, like WikiHouse. You have examples for prosthetics. And all of these are incumbent, but they have to come together. They have to come together in a more coherent system. And not just in economics, but think about politics. So if we talk about free and open, you have the pirate parties. If you talk about fairness, you have parties like Podemos or the Corbyn campaign, etc. If you talk about sustainability, you have the green parties. But they're not necessarily talking to each other. We feel that the commons is the glue that can hold these three types of movements in politics and in the markets together. And with that, we go to our concept of a commons transition. A commons transition means developing a set of policies that put common in the social production of value at the center, open market or bureaucratic considerations. It takes the creative inputs of communities and the needs of their environments to create policies. How is this articulated? Um, in very much the same way that we see the governance of open source software. So for example, you have foundations like the Mozilla Foundation or the Linux Foundation, and they're not directing the production. They are, they're holding up the infrastructure of collaboration. They're holding up the licenses, etc. and they're facilitating. A state is an enabling mechanism for a set of interests. So now we have the market state defending the interests of the market. But if we had the common state, it would enable this social production of value. And this is happening already at the city level in places like Barcelona or my hometown in Madrid, where people from the 15M movement actually have taken power and they said it was impossible. So just to close up um, this very fast presentation, sorry, and I talk very fast, I know. Um, okay, so is this approach utopian? Well, I think that's beside the point because if you think about systems change, they're not deterministic. So. It's not like you can go back to 15th century Florence and you have people sitting around the table saying, we shall create capitalism and we shall create derivatives and this will be capitalistic toilets. These things, there are social innovations that start to find each other and eventually, by the time of the Industrial Revolution, you look back and you say, hey, this is capitalism. This is its characteristics. When we talk about P2P and the commons as a potential catalyst for systems change and due to the speed of communications today, we can see all these dots, we can see all these P2P practices joining together to create a bigger system. Will it work? We don't know, but this is your individual choice if you want to support this movement, if you want to create real resilient communities, if you want to interconnect them, we will increase the chances of this happening. And this is the job of the P2P Foundation. We listen, we research, we advocate for this movement. Um, we help governments, we help companies, but especially we help communities. We help commoners to have a place where they can communicate and have a sense of mutual recognition as part of a burgeoning movement. We have a daily blog with various updates a day, a wiki with over 30,000 entries. 
the P2P lab is a um, research hub, and they're dedicated to empirically demonstrating that everything I'm saying here is actually scalable and could come to life. And Commons Transition is our introductory project to, um, to spread these ideas. And you can follow us here. Uh, thank you so much.